So, Heavenly Father, we just come before you in Jesus' name. I am so grateful for Jesus Christ. I'm grateful for the work that you've done in our lives and in our families. I'm grateful for the work that you do for us at, you know, in our, our businesses and, and our, our ministries. I'm just grateful that, Father, the salvation of Jesus Christ was not about getting us to heaven, but it's saving us every day in all kinds of situations and circumstances. And not only that, then you empower us as ambassadors for Christ. You've commissioned us to go and, and disciple the nations, teaching them to obey what you've taught us so father god we're just going to take this time of worship and we surrender ourselves afresh and anew to you father god we are so grateful jesus gave his life so we could live father let us give our lives to establish your kingdom father for the sake of the people who have no hope for the sake of the people who are outside the covenant, for the sake of the people who are sick or lonely or diseased or afflicted or addicted, Father, for the ones with no hope and no answers, Father, the one within us is the answer to everything. So we just worship you and honour you. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you want to share anything? Well, do it now. Hey all. How's that? That's all good? Great. Uh, let me see here. Can I just... I need a little bit of room here, so can I just... Does that stack? Great. I can just get on the on the end here and do my little thing. Uh, I'm going to start off by reading some scriptures, and they're going to link together, and you will see how they link together and we'll go from there because I believe that we are in an hour in which we need to shift the way we think and shift the, uh, the degree of expectation we have for what God is going to do and what we understand revival to be. So let's just start and uh, I'll give you these scriptures. Uh, turn to Habakkuk 1.5. Ah, uh, minor prophets. Take you ages to find them, perhaps. <laughs> Habakkuk 1.5. I'll, I'll read them out, but you can track with me if you can find them. It says, Look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days which you would not believe that we told you. Look at Ephesians 3.20. You should know that. Now to him, or her, who is able to do exceedingly abundantly, oh no, now to Christ, Christ, who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. So beyond our perception, beyond our capability to understand. 1 Corinthians 2.9 Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Go to Isaiah 55. I'm going through this fast and we'll just see where it goes. Isaiah 55. And then we'll start to build some steam into this and go up through the gears. Isaiah 5. Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. 
For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And just in Isaiah, look at 43. And from verse 18 where it says, Do not remember the form of things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And that came out just before from someone, didn't it, this afternoon? Hmm. And so, we have ideas and concepts of what revival is. We draw from the, uh, the records of what happened in Wales just over 100 years ago, the New Hebrides, Azusa Street in America, Toronto, uh, Pensacola, uh, Lakeland, and, and, and these are all examples of where there's been a, a move of God, a, a refreshing, an awakening, uh, an outpouring, and, and, and when we look at the book of Acts and we see what happened in, on the day of Pentecost and all of that, and so our, our concept and our understanding and our expectations of what revival are are based on these events and these things that, that have happened in history and other places in the world. But God says, behold, I'm going to do a new thing. And it is not going to be revival as we understand it, as we know it, it is going to be something unprecedented in history. And we have to be prepared in our minds to accept something totally, radically, unprecedentedly new. And the hallmarks, I believe, and this is just an expectation and a hope, the hallmarks of what we're going to see is uh, unprecedented angelic visitation. It's already happening. It's already building. It's like the armies of, of heaven uh, mustering, uh, gathering, uh, positioning. And there's going to be war in the heavenlies and there's going to be conflicts that take place and there's going to be nation that rises up against nation and you can read it in Matthew 24 and other places. But it's going to be an hour in which God will say to his children, Arise and shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. And yet we are still challenged with our mindsets. And, and an example is... Uh, if we look at the book of Acts, and that's a, a, a framework of reference for us in this, in this season here in Open Heaven Ministries, we have uh, the, the day of Pentecost, and we have Peter. And here he gets up and he says with a voice that thunders with many waters. So this is, we are, they are not drunk as you would suppose, but this is that which was uh, uh, Voiced by Joel the prophet, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters will prophesy and your old men will dream dreams and your young men will have visions and upon my handmaidens and all of that. And, all of that. and, and, and Peter rose up and he brought a message of salvation and 3,000 people were, were converted that day. And, and Peter uh, walked through the first ten chapters of the book of Acts and, and where his shadow fell, people were getting healed. And he and John walked up to the gates beautiful and, and, and there was the, the, the crippled man, lame from birth, who had seen Jesus come and go for, for many, many years over the preceding three years. And he had heard the stories of blind Bartimaeus being... being uh, uh, given sight and, and the woman with the issue of blood and, and Lazarus and all of these stories and every, every time Jesus walked past this, this guy had this expectation that maybe Jesus would heal him but it wasn't his time it wasn't his moment and Jesus walked in and Jesus walked out and then Jesus died but he rose again and his expectations and faith lifted with it but then Jesus ascended on the 49th, 50th day after he rose. And, and so this guy just settles back into the monotony and the inevitability of the state. 
And then there's Peter and Paul and they come along and he looks up at them and maybe I can get a penny or two. And they say, gold and silver, we have none, but what we have we give unto you. Rise up and walk and boom. And just when the scribes and the Pharisees thought they'd shut the whole thing down after what they saw as the fiasco of Passover and the full impact of what happened on the day of Pentecost hadn't, hadn't reached the, the, the temple yet perhaps. And now here's, here's Peter, here's John, and it's all on again. And, and it's, Jesus is gone, but here's the Holy Spirit. And here's the Holy Spirit going before these, these men of God and it's all happening. And I shared a couple of weeks ago about the multitudes and how God added to the numbers daily and the principles of multiplication that took place and all of that. And, and yet, Peter was still bound with paradigm constraints and preceptions and, and all of that. And, and it took Cornelius... It took a, a man who was in the, the Roman army uh, a commission to go to Peter and shift him out of uh, a Judaic mindset. And, and so he did. But at the same time, the Holy Spirit invades Peter's space. And if you just look at... Is this OK? Uh, I, I'm wanting to challenge you about... How, how much you think you know you've got it sorted, you haven't. Because God is going to do something that is going to blow, <laughs> blow your mind. And even more importantly, totally confound the world and those who sit astride the mountains of culture in their self-imposed self-glory and importance and there's going to be a, a tumbling down of the walls in those mountains. So, Book of Acts, chapter 10. How long have I got? I, I, I don't want to take too long. Yes, watch out when that happens. So, okay... Acts 10, verses 1 to 8. It's the story of Cornelius, and he gets this uh, assignment to go to Peter. And while he's looking to do that, from verse 9, the next day as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up onto the housetop to pray about the sixth hour, about lunchtime. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance. It's interesting that Cornelius had a vision and an angelic visitation, but for, for, for Peter, it was a trance, a different thing. Sharon was talking about that on Monday night, and, or one Monday night anyway, recently. And, and in this trance, Peter saw heaven opened and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners descending to him and let down to the earth. And it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and the birds of the air. And a voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, No, 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 Lord, I, I need to remind you of the law, <laughs> for I've never eaten anything common or unclean. And the voice spoke to him again the second time, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. And this was done three times because with Peter, everything had to be said to him three times, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Which is actually important because you, you, you release a decree or you make an oath and you do it three times before witnesses and it carries the power of law. And so... Um, Sometimes when we've done stuff in the courts of heaven with people, there's been the need sometimes to renounce or decree things three times so that it will be sealed in the spirit and law. So, so back to Peter. Here he is having his mind and his paradigm and his concept of how things should be 
blown wide, wide apart. And I say all of that to say this to you. Be positioned in your spirit to have your concepts of how things should be totally blown apart. And, and the religious will always rise up and say, oh, that's not of God. Gold dust, where is that in the Bible? And all of that. They may not be aware, but, but the Apostle Thomas, when he went to Madras on his mission's commitment, and he established the church in Madras, it is recorded that for two years the floors were just continuously full of gold dust. So, so, there's talk today coming through, and I was getting it before Suzanne released it, about fire. You know, and, and you know, uh, John, this, John says, uh, I baptise you with water, but one comes after me whose shoes I'm unworthy to, to, to tie the laces of, will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And I believe there's a, a, a distinction between the two. And I believe that even 2,000 years down the track, the church knows how to uh, experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But where's the fire? Where's the fire? And so if, if you have a look at 2 Chronicles, chapter 5, verses 11 to 14. Let's do it. Because it talks, it, 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 this is about the dedication of the Temple of Solomon. Mm. And this is something that took place at the occasion of the Feast of Tabernacles. And if you know anything about the Feast of Tabernacles, it's actually three feasts that, that occur in our calendar year, September, October. And, and the first of the three feasts is called Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, and it marks the beginning of the, the Hebrew year. And, but it also speaks of the prophetic. So when, whenever you see or whenever you think of, of, of trumpets in Scripture or in the Spirit, there's a prophetic sound that's being released in the, in the Spirit, okay? So that's trumpets. And that's followed by the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, which is the holiest day of the year in the Israeli calendar, and it's where the high priest goes into the Holy of Holies on behalf of the nation and intercedes and repents for the sins of the nation. And uh, he, he does it with a sense of reverence and fear because this is before grace and the stakes are high in terms of getting it right, dead right or dead wrong. And then that's followed by the, the occasion of tabernacles in which, because this is harvest, harvest year, harvest time of the year, and everyone goes out and they sleep under the stars underneath their little tents, their little tabernacles, that's why it's called tabernacles, and they celebrate the, the, har the great harvest from, from the fields. And it's, and it's a picture of what God is going to framework the great end times revival on coming up to his return. And so uh, how, how he's going to do that, I don't know. You see, on the day of Passover, originally it was about blood on the lintels and the doorposts so the angel of death would pass over. But Jesus became the Passover lamb uh, a thousand or 1,500 years later. And so... The, the understanding of Passover shifted from animal of blood on the doorposts to the sacrifice of Jesus and the rending of the curtain that separated the holy from the holy of holies in the temple. Okay. Pentecost was the day in which Moses went up Mount Sinai and received the law. And so Pentecost was always seen historically before the book of Acts as the occasion in which the handing forth of the Ten Commandments and the law was celebrated. 
But a totally different thing happened on the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts. And so we come up in history to the fulfilment of the, the, the three feasts of tabernacles. What's it going to be like? It's going to be a, a move of the prophetic, and perhaps we're in it now. There's going to be a sense of repentance and, and reconciliation between God and man that we've never seen before. That is going to mark uh, the great end times harvest. And then there's going to be the celebration, the wedding feast, the bride of Christ and the lion of the tribe of Judah who returns as Lord of Lords and King of Kings on the white horse as it's described in Revelation 19. So how all that's going to unfold and, and what our, our ideas of how it might be are rather meaningless because God's ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are greater than ours and he's going to do it according to his plan and you're going to be amazed and astounded. So all of those scriptures we started off with align with all of this. And so I'll just finish with this. Um, 2 Chronicles 5 and it says from 11 and it came to pass when the priests came out of the most holy place for all the priests who were present had sanctified themselves without keeping to their divisions and the Levites who were singers and all those of Asaph and Heman and Jeduthun with their sons and their brethren stood at the east end of the altar clothed in white linen having cymbals stringed instruments and harps with them 120, ding, think the upper room, 120 priests sounding with trumpets. Right on cue. Indeed, it came to pass when the trumpeters and singers were as one, as in, in one accord, get it, to make one sound, you can follow on from that if you like one sound to be heard and praising and thanking the Lord and when they lifted up their voice with their trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord saying for he is good for his mercy endures forever and now get this that the house the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud think of Jew Think of Psalm 133 where it talks about the oil of Aaron down the bed and then it talks about the Jew. We won't go into Psalm 133 but it's there. So that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God and it would be so good at times if the presence of God filled the house to the extent that the priests couldn't preach because if they don't preach, they don't get it wrong, do they? <laughs> so, so that's that's the the, the cloud, the, the mist, the 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 refreshing aspect, and and the glory, so that the priests could not stand and and deliver the word, and and from there Solomon goes into a discourse, and and he talks repeatedly throughout the next two chapters about. Uh, if, if we can hear from heaven, hear from heaven, hear from heaven, all the way through, if we can hear from heaven, this desire to hear the voice of God, the desire to sort of connect in communication with God, we lift up to God prayer after prayer after prayer after prayer, petition and request, demand and frustration. We, we all do it, we've all done it. We've all done it. But here's Solomon saying, let us hear your voice, O God. And, and this shifts things in the spirit. And, and, and as a result of this time, we go to the beginning of chapter 7 and, and Solomon has done his thing. He's done his stuff. And it's like 2,000 years ago, there was a, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But now we're coming to a moment in time where we're going to experience the baptism of fire, yes. a purging fire, a fire where grace is lifted and judgment comes. And when we are aligned with God and repentant before God, we will be empowered by God to do great exploits and be the agents to 
usher in this great end time move of God. Because it says this in chapter 7, after all of that, probably seemed like 2,000 years, you know, the way that Solomon went on, and they're all there, the whole nation, they are all part of the, the experience of the dedication of the temple. And it says, When Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. This is different. This is, you know, Holy Spirit, Jew. This is fire, fire. And it filled the temple. And the priests could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. It's one thing to stand in the glory. It's a thing to uh, be so, uh, the glory to be so intense that there's no way in, not even for the priests. And, and, but for the grace of God, but for, for Christ and what he did on the cross and the, that, that barrier that, that separated us from, from, from God himself was removed and we can actually enter in to the fire and we can actually be baptised in the fire and we can be cleansed and all that is not of God can be removed in our lives so that we can operate totally in the authority and in the will and in the empowerment of God. I'll just finish with this. Last verse. Haggai 2, 9 and 10. Haggai 2, from, from verse 7. And it says, And I will shake all nations... And they shall come to the desire of all nations. And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. And the glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. And so are these the latter days? Are these the days in which the former and latter rains fall in the same month? I believe so. I believe we are there at a threshold and we have to shift our position to be aligned with Christ and we have to allow our minds to be totally open to behold a new thing. Okay? Thanks. What I want to share actually follows on very much from what Logan's been saying and there's some of the scriptures he had. Um, God has given me examples of as well. I often find that um, the Lord takes me to a scripture and he will not let me move from that scripture and I can get stuck in the scripture for quite a while. And the one that is on the Lord's heart for me at this time is Psalm 29. So I'm going to read you Psalm 29. And it says this, Give unto the Lord, O you mighty ones, give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. And then there's a shift, and it talks about the voice of the Lord. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Yes, the Lord splinters the cedars of Lebanon. He makes him also skip like a calf. Lebanon and Syrian like a young wild ox. 
The voice of the Lord divides the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And in his tent one says, one says, glory. The Lord sat enthroned at the flood, and the Lord sits as king forever. The Lord will give strength to his people, and the Lord will bless his people with peace. So 18 times in that psalm, it talks about the voice of the Lord. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, functions on sound and on frequency. Right from the word go, if you go back to Genesis, God spoke creation into being. In fact, some some translations talk about how God sings. But he spoke um, creation into being. And if you look at... Um, the various people through scripture, it's the voice of the Lord that spoke. Take Moses. The voice of the Lord spoke to him in the fire in the burning bush. Um, Through uh, some of the other prophets, he spoke as well. Logan talked about the temple. Um, The voice of the Lord responds to the praises this, particularly with frequencies, the voice of the Lord responds to unity and he responds to praise. Unity actually has a sound. And if you look at the example that Logan has just given with in, in Chronicles, with the um, dedication of the temple, they were all in one accord. The musicians were making one sound and then the glory of the Lord came. When the people marched around Jericho and they made one sound, the walls came down. When the people were in Acts, waiting in the upper room, they were in one accord and then the Holy Spirit came. So the Lord responds to the sound of unity. And so one of the things that I believe is very crucial at this time that we're in is unity. Um, Yesterday... Logan and I were at a pastor's apostolic breakfast and there were people there from uh, different ministries, different ethnicities. We were welcomed into the place by the Aboriginal elders and people had an opportunity to share. And you could pick up, you could feel in the room that there was a spirit of unity. And because there was a spirit of unity, the angels turned up, the presence of God turned up and there was so much blessing because people came to love on one another and to bless one another and they didn't come with an agenda and what is happening we're at a time where there is a new sound and a new frequency being released the Holy Spirit is moving on this land of Australia and he is going to respond to people as they cry out but in unity and as they praise him. We have to walk very carefully in these days. The Lord spoke to me about how there are many competing voices. We have voices of confusion out there. We've got voices of distraction. And we've got voices of deception. You know, I broke my heart yesterday, really, because there was a pastor sharing, and he said... This is what we're dealing with at the moment. He said, there is a a spirit of relativism relativism that has come in. And he said, what's being said is, your truth, or say my truth, is my truth to me, but Val's truth is her truth to her. And so you've got churches now that are shutting down their programs of evangelism. Because what is truth to me may not be truth to you. So therefore we're not going to debate the word of God. You can have what you believe, but I'll believe something different. And we've got this creeping into the church. We need to tune our our eyes and our ears to what God is saying. Because it's God doesn't bring confusion. He brings clarity. And in that clarity is unity. And God doesn't bring distraction. He brings focus. 
And God doesn't bring deception. He brings us the truth. And here this is happening. This is happening in our nation now. We're getting this kind of deception happening where what is truth for you in the word is not the same as truth for me in the word. And it's, it's all just relative. This is, this is serious stuff, people. But the, the Lord is releasing a new sound and a new frequency and he wants his people to pick that up and run with it. You have all been called as transformers and he's wanting you to arise at this time, arise and shine and decree forth the sound of the Lord in this land and it's a sound of unity, it's a sound of praise but it's going to bring transformation to this land so my challenge to you today is that we all have a sound that we bring forth what we say out of our mouth what we speak frames our world just as God spoke the creation into being so you create your world what comes out of your mouth frames your world Another thing that really concerns me is, and it happens quite a lot, is people will say to me, oh, I don't hear or I don't see. Well, you won't if you confess that with your mouth. You know, you've got to you, you turn it around and say, thank you, Lord, I can see. Thank you, Lord, I can hear. Thank you, Lord, you have activated my senses. God will work with people who will work with him. But if you have a negative confession, he's not going to work with you. And he is calling his body of Christ to have one sound. It's a sound of unity. It's a sound of the power of God to bring transformation into this nation. And so he's calling you to arise. So my challenge to you is what words are coming out of your mouth to frame your word? your world are they positive are they declaring the power of God in your life or are they not are they negative oh God doesn't use me oh I can't hear or I don't see it's only for someone who's anointed one of the worst things in, in Christian church is the qualifying spirit and that's that needs to be got rid of you are all anointed you are all qualified we are all in ministry. We are all called to be ambassadors for Christ. You all have something to share. That's why I love being here with Pastor Suzette because she will say to you, has anybody got something? Please share. We are the body. We're all supposed to work together. My gifting is different to your gifting. And I saw this yesterday when we were at this breakfast. Many ministries, many different giftings, but we were all in one accord working together. So I challenge you, think about what you're declaring. Are you declaring the goodness of God in your life? Are you declaring transformation in your life? Are you declaring he's a good, good father? And are you declaring the coming move of the Spirit of God over this land? Because he is poised. Somebody had a, um, a vision, a lady that in, lives in the hinterland in Australia, and God opened her eyes to this vision, and she saw Australia as a womb. And in the vision, the womb opened, and the waters flooded out, and it goes with what you had. Jeunesse about the, the dry land God is wanting to move on this land and we as a body of people need to get together and have one voice one sound God you are moving on this land you are going to bring transformation so I challenge you in that area this today thank you um <laughs> so we do have angels here with trumpets so I think what I'd like you to do is to all stand thank you Lord and yes there is an increase in angelic um, activity angels respond to the welcome that they receive and they know that they are welcome in this place 
And as you talk about angels, as you welcome them, they come. They come to listen, but they also come to work with you. And there are angels here today who have trumpets in their hands. And what I'd like you to do is just, if that's you, raise your hands to receive because I believe that they're going to, to blow their trumpets over you to release a new sound and a new frequency because this is what God is wanting to do, not just in Australia, but in New Zealand and the islands of the Pacific. At the moment, God's heart is particularly on the great south lands of the Holy Spirit because this is where the end time move of God is going to start and then it will flood the earth. So put your hands up and by faith, as those angels blow those trumpets, receive a new sound and a new frequency into your spirit. In the name of Jesus, thank you, Lord. Something I meant, I meant to, is that working? Just something I meant to, to say earlier when I was talking about the, take a seat for a moment, that's fine. Uh, when I was talking about the, the Feast of Trumpets and it's, it's, uh, it's trumpets, atonement and, and, and tabernacles and, and, uh, and th- it was the, that season when the Temple of Solomon was dedicated. But, but Sharon talked about Jericho. And you know the story of Jericho, how they walked around the city. And they walked around the city in a particular order. The trumpeters went forth first. And then they carried the Ark of the Covenant after the trumpeters. And then all of the people followed the, the trumpeters and the Ark. And so the the trumpeters, Feast of Trumpets, the Ark of the Covenant, Day of Atonement, and all of the people following together in unity, Tabernacles. Now, Pastor Suzette said earlier that this is today is Palm Sunday. And Jesus enters the city of Jerusalem on uh, a donkey. But there are those who are going in front of him saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, this is the... They are prophesying this is the Messiah. And, and who are, those who were going ahead of the procession were uh, the, the, the prophets, the trumpet, the a picture, a capture of the, the Feast of Trumpets. And then there's Jesus sitting in, on, on the, 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 white, the white pony. It's like the mercy seat. It's, it's a picture of, a time, you know, your redemption enters in the form of Jesus. Repent this day, for the Lord of glory is entering the city. And then there are all of those following the procession and, and, and you know, uh, the, the large group, picture of tabernacles. But this is the week before Passover, and there is this uh, alignment and connection between all of the different feasts. And if you think of the menorah, it consists of a, a central stem, and on one side there are three branches for, for three lamps. On the other side there are three branches for three lamps. And we have the seven feasts. We have the three feasts of Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits. And then 50 days later, there's Pentecost. It's a lo- standalone event. And then, later on in the calendar year, there's the... As I've just said, trumpets, uh, atonement, and tabernacles. The other three branches, but they are all one. They all align, they all interconnect, they all have relevance in terms of God's grand master plan for redemption of mankind that began with Abraham. That's where the plan for redemption first began to be put in place. We're heading up in history to a time in which that will be complete with his return as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. So that just ties back in. All yours?